good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, it is my uh, pleasure and privilege to uh, moderate our uh, webinar today um, about enhancing uh, the patient experience in the COVID-19 um, uh, uh, pandemic era. We have assembled for you a, a fantastic uh, a faculty uh, as well as uh, uh, discussants. So today we have with us uh, as discussants, uh, Professor uh, Miguel Herrera. He's a professor of endocrine and bariatric surgery at the National Institute of Medical Sciences and Nutrition in Mexico. He is also the chair of the IFSO uh, communication, uh, IFSO scientific committee rather, and the president of the Mexican Society for Bariatric and Metabolic Surgery. Welcome, Miguel. Uh, a discussant you. also is uh, Professor Aydal Qahtani. He's a professor of minimally invasive surgery and bariatric surgery at New U Medical Center uh, in Saudi Arabia. And then we have three presenters who will present today uh, how to enhance the uh, patient experience in bariatric surgery. Um, uh, and I'll uh, present them in, in reverse order. Third is Parveen Raj. Parveen is the head of the Department of Bariatric Surgery at Gem Hospital in both Coimbatore and Chennai in India. He is the president-elect of the Obesity Surgery Society of, uh, of India. Uh, welcome, uh, uh, Parveen. Uh, we also have today a, a new uh, member uh, with us uh, uh, that I've met for the first time this time, Dr. Uh, Sonia um, Kaipata. I, I hope I didn't butcher her name. Uh, she is uh, a bariatric surgeon from Italy, and uh, she works at the uh, Evangelico Villa Britannia in Naples in, in Italy. So welcome, Sonia. And uh, uh, finally, we have first, we'll present Dr. Uh, Betsy Dovek from, from the US, from Baltimore, uh, Maryland, uh, from GBMC. Um, I know Betsy well, uh, and uh, she's going to also tell us about how to use uh, the internet uh, to, to enhance the patient experience. So a few items before we get started. Before each presentation, we're going to launch a poll. So we'd like to hear your feedback. Uh, participating in these polls. There's also a question section. Please uh, post your questions. Uh, I'll make sure we address all your questions during the presentations. As you know, these webinars are going to be recorded and they will be in the, uh, if so, uh, virtual academy that you can access either on the website online or on the IFSO app, and they will be in the IFSO YouTube channel. So without uh, further ado, I'm going to ask Manuela, who's always in the background, making sure that these things work, uh, launch the first poll. So um, uh, if you can uh, take this uh, uh, minute to, to answer the poll, and I'll take this moment to maybe ask um, Miguel um, to tell us about what are the things that they have done uh, in Mexico to enhance the patient experience during uh, this COVID-19 crisis. Miguel. Well, before uh, I should start saying that in Mexico, we are still at uh, the top of the wave. So we are preparing, but we haven't had the opportunity to experience if, if this is work. So what we are planning is to have uh, remote consultations and also remote follow-up. And we are ready to start working with all personal protection uh, for usage in all patients. And... Uh, to have designated areas for COVID patients in some hospitals and to have uh, hospitals fully devoted to COVID patients and also hospitals that are reasonably clean. Great, great, thank you. Um, uh, so, uh, Manuela, can you uh, show us the result of the, uh, the poll? The poll talked about what's the most efficient way to prepare and educate patients. So it seems like the uh, most efficient way still is in-person visits with the bariatric surgeon preoperatively. 34% feel that way. Um, in very close second, uh, telemedicine visits with dietitians, um, then utilizing standard digital education platform, 22%, and finally consecutive monthly visits. So I think, um, uh, having known Betsy, I think the, her talk is very well situated to try to address uh, 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 this poll. So without further ado, I'd like to have uh, Betsy Dovek um, uh, 
tell us about uh, uh, her experience uh, with enhancing patient experience during this this era. Betsy, please go ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you for this opportunity to everyone out there watching. I think that across the world, we may all have our very different nuances on how we treat our patients, but there is a lot of fundamentals that are the same no matter where we're located. As you heard, I'm located um, just outside of Washington, D.C. in uh, north of Baltimore, Maryland in the United States. And I am coming from a community hospital. I am a community hospital employed physician at the Greater Baltimore Medical Center. It has about 230 beds. And I came here right out of fellowship. So I am 39 years old. I have been out for about seven years now. And in that time, my claim to fame is that I started, um, they were doing about 300 operations a year. And with my partner, Dr. Gus Bello and myself, we now do over 1,300. We've increased it by over 1,000 patients. And we've done this by absolutely focusing on the patient experience. So, Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan has a documentary out in the US, maybe it's available all over the world right now, called The Last Dance. And it goes through his 1997-98 uh, world champion NBA final, um, his final dance in, in playing basketball. But watching this, I learned there are so many similarities in terms of trying to achieve greatness and trying to be the best in the field. And if you're on this webinar today, chances are you are also trying trying to be the best at treating our patients. Michael uh, had many, many notable quotes. Um, he talked a lot about, it doesn't matter how great his shoe was or Gatorade or McDonald's or any of these other things. The big focus was on the game, it was on playing the game to the best of his ability. People came to, the, to those games to see Michael perform. People, they cared about the whole experience, but Michael knew he had to be magical in the game. And I want to challenge you to be magical too. You need to show up. You need to be present. And you also need to embrace your team. You need to know that the team approach is absolutely critical, but you need to lead the team as a bariatric surgeon. And change can be hard, and some of this new virtual reality is very difficult. But here's the biggest quote that I love from him. I can accept failure. Everyone fails at something but I can't accept not trying. So I'm gonna challenge all of you on that poll you just heard. The answer, number one answer was that patient, that, that our programs, our surgeons out there, think the best way to see patients before surgery is by seeing them in person. I'm gonna challenge you to try something different, to think about going virtual. How can you do that? Well, here's what we've done. These are my exact numbers. I took this screenshot this morning and you can see our volumes. I'm going to put it out there. Now, our volumes are the green means conversions means the new patients that are submitting their information to our practice. Right now, in the middle of the end, hopefully the end of COVID-19, we are seeing an increase in numbers that I have never seen in my career. I told you we were busy, but now I feel like we are getting even busier. For example, on May 27th, just a couple of days ago, we had 21 new patients that are eager to get started with our program. How do we do it? I could talk here for 12 hours. I have 10 minutes and I, and I need to be respectful of that. But I think it's imperative that you simplify the process for the patients. You break down barriers, you get out of your own way. You make your website easy. What is the call to action? How does a patient get started? You don't need to overwhelm them with information. They can take a deep dive and find that. Simplify the get started now button. You can also utilize Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, social media, digital marketing. We're going to hear from another one of our colleagues later on that. And then you need to connect with people. You can connect with more people, a much bigger reach. Look at us right now. We're talking all around the world together. So why can't you connect patients together? Why does it have to be your own little island? Explore, expand, connect. You can do it. So telemedicine, virtual initial consult, that's what I'm going to focus my talk on today. And we do this by actually having the patients do the entire experience through their phones or on a web browser. We make it easy. We meet them where they're at. In the United States, 96% of Americans have cell phones. 89% of those patients have smartphones. Patients have these. I'm sure it's very similar across the world, or they can get some kind of internet access. We will have our patients 
fill out their information, this information will actually go and integrate into their electronic medical record. Cut down on unnecessary steps. Improve workflow efficiencies within your office uh, space. I will have my medical assistant then contact the patient by phone and she will virtually room them. She will confirm all of their past medical, social, family, surgical history. She will get the vitals over the phone. How tall are you? What are you weigh? What is your BMI? Do you have an Apple Watch? Do you have a Fitbit? What is your heart rate? You can get a lot of information that is super similar to if the patient was even there in person. And then I do something very different that I challenge you again to embrace. At this point, I will actually have all of the patients that I'm going to see that are new patients, I will see them all together as a group. Again, they're coming to see me, so I give this presentation as the surgeon, and I introduce them to our program. I tell them why my program in Towson, Maryland is the best and why you need to be there, why we have big giants, Johns Hopkins, University of Maryland, several other programs around, but people are coming to our program more than theirs. Why? Because we give them the resources that they need to succeed. We're on Facebook, we're on Instagram, we have secret support groups. Our website is simple, easy to use, and just chock full of information. We then simplify the process. We don't make them run all over the, the world or the countryside to try to figure out and find these things. I tell them exactly how to get started. And then I explain the risks, the benefits, the alternatives to surgery. But I don't lead with that. I don't lead with the, the fact that you might get a leak or a bleed and you might die. No, I lead with the fact that, my goodness, you need to focus on your why. Why do you want to lose weight? Why are you here? And with that, I can help you. I don't care why they're there. I don't care if they want to fit into skinny jeans or they want to get rid of their diabetes. That doesn't matter to me. If they say they're motivated, I believe that they're motivated and I'm motivated to help them. I will do everything in my power. That is what we do for a living. We help those who want to be helped to change their lives. And you never need to forget that. So after they do the group session, they will then do a private video visit with me. We have something called electronic medical record called Epic. You can use Doximity, you can use Zoom, you can use um, webinars. There's so many different HIPAA compliant safe modes of doing a virtual telemedicine visit. And I'll tell you what, it's more personal, it's better care, everybody's on time, the patients love it. I'm in their personal space, I meet their pets, I meet their families, I see their kids, I see their medicine cabinets, they can show me their meds, they can take me in their refrigerator, they can show me a label. I feel like I am a better doctor because of telemedicine and I even will dare to say I will never go back to in-person visits for the rest of my career. There's no need to. This is convenient. Patients don't have to take time off of work. They don't have to drive. They don't have to pay for gas. They don't have to pay their co-pays. They're there virtually in their space at their time and it is going to change the game. This is what we need need. In the United States, less than 1% of patients who qualify for bariatric surgery get it, and telemedicine will finally move that needle. We can do this, but we all need to do it together across the world. So what do I do then? Again, I need two things from a patient. I need to know that they are motivated, and I need to know that they are willing to be educated. So years ago, my partner and I, Gus, we thought, you know what, this is already a barrier. So about three years ago, we started something called NewTryHealth.com. Patients can get started there, and this is a standardized digital education program so that they get the most up-to-date information. They watch professionally video animated uh, presentations that are very short, sweet, to the point, and then they read more information and then they take a quiz. So they get started and it's available online or through mobile app. Again, reach patients where they're at. No need to give them an email that comes of information or give them binders. Our printing costs alone, once we got rid of that, decreased 12,000 US dollars per year. We also can tell you that in the United States, insurance is looking for patients to be educated. So by utilizing Nutri Health, they're getting that done. It's effective. We look at the patient's food, their exercise, their weight logs. We can see how they're doing in a granular detail in a way we never could before. And they can assess it 24-7 at their own time, their own pace, their own convenience, and they are succeeding because of it. We don't just fo focus on getting that sound nutritional education. We also teach 
teach them about the disease of obesity. We teach them about exercise. And then also all of those important mindset changes. How do you change your habits? How do you set your goals? How do you succeed in the long term? It takes a full comprehensive approach. The new try is for three things, change your mind, change your body, and change your life. And that is what we are trying to succeed with our patients. So who cares? Well, I think this aside is very important because it shows you to the left our surgical volumes. Again, they're on the increase, but on the right, that in-person volume, that traffic, the number of dietitians and overhead and calls and scheduling and all of that stuff, goes down. So we are preparing our patients better, the patients are staying with our program, and we are decreasing our overhead funds to be able to accomplish that. We've written an article for SWORD that looks at this, and we want this to be rapidly communicated to everybody that if patients utilize a standardized digital education platform, they will actually be better prepared. Their outcomes are as good, if not better, than the traditional in-person, but our retention rates from that initial consult through surgery is statistically significantly improved. You're going to be able to hold on to patients. This is what patients want. And at the end of the day, that's all that matters. Not what you think, but what they want so that they'll do it. And also they're satisfied with it. They find it convenient, easy to understand, very doable. So I challenge you to adopt a standardized digital education platform like Nutri Health. So, my time is up, but I want to end you with this. This is the most important thing, the why. You've heard talks on this before. Nobody cares how you do something or what you do. They care why you do it. I care why my patients are there. Why do they want to change their life? But you always need to self-reflect and look at yourself. Why are you on this call today? Why do you want to improve the patient experience? Are you willing to do things to accomplish that why? And I hope that you are you can connect with me. I would love to hear from you all over the world. My email is Betsy Dovec, D-O-V-E-C at gmail.com. I'm also on Instagram, Dr. Dovec, all one word, D-R-D-O-V-E-C. I hope that you will reach out to me, that we can connect and share our best practices to help our patients to succeed in this time and beyond. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, thank you, Betsy, for, for an excellent presentation and for staying on time. I really appreciate it. There is, there is a question from uh, Dr. Maud Kolas uh, to you, Betsy. Uh, uh, talks about what about the billing and copayment? Um, how, like, how does that work in the US? And, and I would like to also, uh, after you answer it, ask both our discussants, Miguel Herrera and uh, Dr. Aydel Pahtani, to answer from the perspective of Mexico and Saudi Arabia. Please go ahead. So in the United States, um, we have um, different billing and coding. And I think that I'm going to just challenge, again, the physicians out there. We, we always think that we have to either do an established e &M visit, a 99214 or 215, or a new patient, 99204205. But I've actually worked with um, some billing consultants who specialize in obesity medicine. And I have learned that by utilizing that group session, that is still face-to-face -face time with the patient from the physician, which greater than 50% is spent in the counseling and coordination of care. And so I'm able to bill because of the medical decision-making and complexity at the highest level, um, 99205. But in addition, you can write this down, a 99354 is a prolonged service code. If you talk for at least 31 minutes, utilize 99354, and you will actually get more um, reimbursement um, by combining those things than if you even did a level five alone. There's also preventative codes. There's something called remote patient monitoring where you can give out um, very inexpensive scales, 40 bucks. Every time a patient steps on a scale, you'll get those data points. You look at it, you can intervene in real time, patients gaining weight, plateaued, how can you help them? And then you can ultimately um, get somewhere upwards of around $56 per patient per month just by them stepping on a scale. And if you see several thousand patients patients a year, you can do the math. So there is a lot of, I believe, reimbursement revenue stream. Sometimes this is a business and needs to be looked at as such that you can actually make um, a lot of money by utilizing insurance. They want to help. You just need to know what, how you need to document, play their game, and then you'll get reimbursed as such. So the, the group billing, that is a, a virtual visit uh, billing, not an in-person. Is that correct? 
So I'm doing a two part of visit. So the first part of my uh, consultation is a shared group medical appointment. So there are, um, these are well established, well known, and I utilize that portion, the group portion as the time with the prolonged service code. Then in addition, I will meet with the patient privately for around 15 plus minutes. We do a video visit. They've already gotten that 30, 45 minute presentation. They know the, the meat of what you're trying to teach. And then you do that additional private um, portion and you can bill again for that. So you can bill two service codes um, for each appointment and, um, and make more money. And these two service codes are virtual codes or are in-person codes? They're in-person codes, but uh, CMS and major commercial payers have accepted these standard uh, codes that are in-person. They're utilizing them just the same for telemedicine. There are certain disclaimers you need to put into your note. For example, you need to say where you are located at your hospital, the patient is at their home, they've given virtual consent, the start of the group session, the stop, the start of the individual session and the stop, and then just what exactly the content that you discussed all needs to be documented. I'm happy to share all of my templates and things um, with anyone out there who's interested on how I've been able to really increase our, our revenue stream. Sure. So this might be maybe state to state because in North Carolina, you're only allowed to, to bill for virtual visits uh, if you do the, the visit virtually. So uh, let me ask, let me, let, let, let me hear from Miguel and Ayub. How do you, how do you get the, the billing uh, uh, sorted if you do something virtually in Mexico or in Saudi Arabia? Well, in, in, in Mexico, since uh, only a few companies, few insurance companies cover bariatric surgery, we haven't spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to get reimbursement. So most bariatric surgeries pay in cash. So what we are uh, doing now is establishing these remote consultations at a lower fee. And the other thing that's different in Mexico is that patients don't like in-group consultations. So we meet with the patient face-to-face, -face, one by one, and then uh, again, without a, a regulation, we have thought that perhaps reducing the cost of the consultation may attract more patients because they are not used for these remote consultations. Sure. Ayat, how about in Saudi Arabia? I'll tell you, Abdurrahman, and the team that in Saudi Arabia, and I think in the region, there are um, three important points. One is the platform, that is, what platform we should be using and so on and so forth. Just recently, the MOH, Ministry of Health in Saudi Arabia, legalized and officialized the uh, telehealth and teleconsultation. It was not part of the protocol because if you consult somebody or even if he demands a refund or so and a teleconsultation, legally before there was a concern in that. Now it's part of the uh, service or e-services that can be provided. So this is one of uh, issues in terms of legal issues related to the practice. The other is the platform. We don't have yet, unfortunately, Zooms or others. Yes, they are good, but they are usually public, uh, some sort of platform. They are not yet integrated in the practice of telehealth, at least in our region. Confidentiality is an issue. Patients are concerned. What will happen to this consultation and this talk and this? They are worried about pictures, they are worried about phones, they are worried. So still there are some barriers in that uh, uh, situation and we need to overcome that barrier. In terms of billing and your questions, what we offer our patients, and we just started because of this COVID issues, we uh, offer them to discounted consult. Usually there is a phone, consult a phone uh, discussions initially on the phone without a virtual uh, um, uh, meeting with the coordinators and they will discuss with them a lot of issues and their concern and how is it safe for them. And then if they agree, they will go for a teleconsultation with the physician, then that will be discounted usually almost 50% of the usual consult on-site visit. And then from there, we'll take it onwards. There are other utilization our areas, especially for follow-up and especially in COVID area where we over the all multidisciplinary team, the dietitian, everybody will consult with the patient at their home, will give them uh, all type of instruction and others. Some of them virtual through different platforms like Facebook, uh, FaceTime or others, and some of them by the phone and, and, uh, tele and uh, electronic or uh, e-communications. All right, thank you, Ayat. So before we move to the next presentation, there are some questions for Betsy. So I'm gonna pick 
one of them now and maybe we'll get the rest at the end. So there is a question from Jay Totkar from India and she's asking you about the medical legal implication or safety with an online consultation. What's your experience? I I think that patients, uh, it can be done very safely through, I mean, there's these HIPAA compliant platforms, you know, even in the United States, CMS has allowed Facebook Messenger to be used, uh, FaceTime through iPhones. Uh, so medically, legally, uh, I'm not experiencing um, any issue. Uh, patients, you know, we're trusting it. It's a conversation just like any other, documenting it, like I said, just the same. So I'm not experiencing any um, significant issues. I don't know if you are um, down in the North Carolina or not. Um, I'm just not. Uh, no, we're not. We're not. And we actually, we, we are using uh, uh, virtual health. I, I would like to ask you at the end, uh, uh, once the presentations are finished, about how do you get people engaged? Seems like you have one partner who's already engaged. What I've found difficult is to get uh, the dietitians, the physicians, the other surgeons in a large program feeling that this is something they would like to, to do. Changing people's practices is not easy. Change is hard. Hardest. Yes. So, so thank you. Thank you again, Betsy. And I think there are some questions from the participants. I also have some questions that we will address at the end, but I would like us to, to move to the next pre presentation, uh, uh, Dr. Parveen Raj. But before he starts, I would like uh, Manuela to launch the next poll. Um, and maybe we'll, we'll utilize uh, the time of the poll uh, to ask a question or, or, or two. So first I'll read the poll. Who will be your first question as you work uh, bariatric surgery? So wh while we're answering that question, maybe if I can ask Betsy to answer one of the questions that people have, have, have presented here. So uh, someone asked uh, Dr. Hatim Al Saudi, um, how many patients do you have in the group session uh, consultation, Betsy, when you do? I have up to 12. Uh, so what I do is I start at nine o'clock a.m. I will see 12 from nine from nine o'clock to 9:30, and then from 9:30 to 12:30 for the next three hours, I will see patients. Then privately after the group session, in individual video visit appointments, and the technology that I use there is our epic electronic medical record. Um, it's called MyChart. So it's very easy. Um, patients just go into MyChart, they click on appointments, e-check-in, and then there we are connected. So I will see 12 patients at a time, always protected time. I have three and a half hours dedicated to it on my office days. And are you allowed to bill twice for the same patient in the same day? Yes. Okay, interesting. Uh, because we, we've, we found it in North Carolina difficult to build twice even for two providers, meaning we cannot get the dietitians and the surgeons or the right. dietitians and the physicians to see the patients at the same time and get billed twice. Exactly. There are those scenarios where you cannot bill twice, that where um, if it's the dietitian, but you can bill two different service codes for that visit. I should maybe rephrase it. So if you're if you so see them in the morning and oh, you can't do it twice. By four? Right now, I use an, a 99205 and a 99354, yes. So the 354 is the group visit? Is the group's visit for the prolonged service code. As long as you're talking to them for at least 31 minutes, that will count towards that. Now, you have, now I know that you know, some hospitals billing and coding, this is different. This is unusual. I've had to, you know, we're really looking into this. And, um, and that's why I, I, I'm getting the advice of somebody who specializes in this. So I'm happy to share the information that I've received. Yeah. Um, and we're still in the um, early stages of it, uh, but it seems to be pretty promising. Sure. So there is, there is actually a request from uh, Dr. Maud uh, Colas to uh, share the information. So if you can share it with Manuela, she will be able to to disseminate it, that would be greatly appreciated. So Manuel, if you can show us the, the, the poll uh, results, please. Okay, so 55% young non-comorbid patient, 31% um, uh, obese with comorbidities, and 11% super obese. Now, um, um, if we can uh, uh, get the presentation of, of uh, Parveen, and, and while that's getting uh, ready, uh, you know, last, uh, week there was a webinar that was led by IFSO about re-entry and they discussed you know the the uh, pros and cons of 
entering with high risk or low risk patients, I would recommend you look at it. Um, uh, some groups like the DSS group have published starting with the highest risk patients. Uh, we have published our uh, protocol as well as the Cleveland Clinic people. So I think it, it's an area that 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 is evolving and, a, and I think Parveen is gonna uh, cover it for us. So Parveen, please uh, uh, go go ahead. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen from India. So I think this is a right time on a Friday evening at 6 p.m. India. So it's more of time for the, the whiskeys for surgery rather than actually a surgical seminar. But then I think I think I should thank Ipso for this wonderful uh, session that's been on and uh, for Betsy covering most of the talk that I'm supposed to be doing. So my talk will be on um, engaging patients and ensuring safety of the patients as they are around in the hospital. I don't have any disclosures. However, my presentation will be more from a surgeon and a hospital administrator standpoint because I do some hospital administration role too. So I would try to uh, handle it from either aspects of it. So I come from the southern part of India, down south, which is Chennai and Coimbatore. Interestingly, why this is important is uh, we have a national divide in the sense even the disease profile with regard to comorbidities, obesity is much different compared to the northern part of India because where in the northern part of India, the phenotype is more similar to the western part of Asia, which is from the Middle East. And the southern part of India, the phenotype is much similar to the southeast part of Asia. And then today in this presentation, I mean, as part slide? of this presentation, I'm... we don't see your slides. Oh, the slides aren't on yet. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I thought so the slides were on. Slide. That's all right. I'm sorry about that. That's okay. I think the slides are already on. Um, are you seeing okay. my slides now? Um, so let me double. I am seeing the poll. Maybe some. Can someone else comment if they're seeing the slide? We see the poll only. We don't see your slide. Yeah, we don't see your slide. So what I would recommend, uh, Manuela, can you uh, give him access to share his slides? And then he should be able to do it. Because so you need to, yeah, okay. So, so now try to share your slides. Try it now, because she took down the poll. Are you seeing the screen now? No. I'll let you know once I see them. So uh, try to share your slides again. Okay. And the moment I see them, I'll let you know. Now we yeah. can see them, you can go ahead. You can see now. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. So I come from the southern part of India, and phenotypically, we are I'm sorry about Yes. Yeah. So phenotypically, this is a, a different part compared to the northern part, as I've just mentioned to you. So coming on to the presentation, which is about engaging patients and ensuring safety of the patients. So by engaging patients, we mean there are three set of patients that we need to be engaging. One, the patients who were evaluated and who are planned for surgery and who are evading surgery to be undergone as we move on. Two, post-bariatric surgical patients, which were patients operated prior to the COVID era, but more importantly, patients who were operated just prior to the COVID era because they would be missing the in hospital visits. As you saw from Betsy's presentation that uh, most of them believe that in hospital visits would give them much better care. So these are the set of patients who believe that they will be coming to the hospital, but they were missing the hospital visits because they were just operated prior to the COVID era. And non-surgical patients. I think as surgeons, we should not be just bothered about surgical patients, etc. There could be so many patients that we may not have operated, patients who are probably not waiting surgery. We might have put them on a multidisciplinary therapy. We might have put them on a medical management. So even these set of patients, I think we should not be leaving them. We need to be having efforts in place by our team to engage them so that we maintain a good follow up for them. Because at the end of the day, we shouldn't be just looking at numbers and the bariatric surgical patients should be a concern. And we also need to ensure safety because as we are moving on towards starting elective surgical work, including bariatric surgeries, as the time comes, we need to ensure safety of these patients, especially during their hospital visit or during the hospital stay. So starting with the engaging of the patients. So these are the three set of patients that we need to be engaging. So what are the important aspects? What is this engagement by which we mean? The clinical care needs to continue. For example, the weight management, the management of comorbidities like the diabetes and hypertension, the obstructive sleep apnea, which these could be the primary reasons why they actually came to us for getting the bariatric surgery, 
and we might have evaluated them and as they were waiting surgery now the surgery isn't happening so we need to be ensuring as the primary bariatric surgeon that the ongoing clinical care with regard to these happens and also with regard to the nutritional aspects primarily on the post bariatric surgical patients and the non surgical patients who are on a non surgical management so the clinical care needs to ongoing even during lockdown motivation these are primarily patients if you actually look at your obese patients predominant of them have some kind of a psychological disability it could be depression it could be anxiety so that is why if you actually look at most obese patients in general are psychologically disabled now with the ongoing lockdown the weight could have had increased the comorbidities might have worsened directly related to covid the financial stress could have come in the covid related stress might have come in so these could have actually made them psychologically more disabled so it is our duty to make sure the new motivation also continues to be there that only when that is there the ongoing lifestyle management can continue to happen so we need to make sure the motivation continues when there is a motivation we need to have a right kind of a support i mean for a bariatric community i do not have to um, uh, stress the need for a support group and a virtual support group i think betsy has covered about the virtual aspect of it we need to look at a virtual support group because ongoing support in the terms of nutritional in terms of psychology in terms of sleep patterns in terms of small physical exercises or small things like a yoga or a tabata kind of exercises or aerobics that could be done at home so we need to devise virtual support group meetings to continue to support them even as they are locked down more importantly the follow up needs to be maintained at the end of the day the success of bariatric surgery is not about the procedures that we do but it is about a good follow up and making sure right interventions are given at the right point of times not just in the short term but in the long term so for maintaining a good follow up engaging a patients is important and for this you have your entire multidisciplinary team that is available yes if there is no covid in the hospital within the hospital entire team could be there or each one of the teams from their home they could be doing the multidisciplinary care and you have the different kinds of the virtual media that is available i mean with different platform the zoom to the facebooks to the skypes the blue jeans the whatsapps the whatsapp calls the facetimes but we need to make sure although this is going to be virtual although most of us believe in house hospital visits are going to be the best we need should not be compromising we need to be giving the best care that we are supposed to be giving to a patient our entire team needs to be motivated our entire team needs to get them technologically up to because many times we we are not really technological geeks of course most often the surgeons are the ones we need to get our team in place we need to motivate them that the multidisciplinary care can, needs to continue especially this sub subset of patients who have just had their surgery prior to the covid era who are missing these in hospital visits we need to be ensuring that this is for example one of the events that i'm planned this sunday in my center where this is like a, a just a healthy cooking kind of an, a webinar that we have planned where we've actually selected a few patients who would be coming up with healthy recipes who will be sharing these recipes with the many other patients and we would be interacting with the patients on the uh, caloric formula the constituent of each of these foods the healthy part of these foods so kind of making our patients chefs because it is interesting to them because if we are continuing to talk it's quite boring it's interesting they are sharing their recipes they are enthusiastic but at the same time indirectly we are giving making sure the follow up is done we are engaging them at the same time we also show them that we actually care for our patients because this is the right time that we show our patients that we care for them in fact many a countries at least countries like india where virtual consultation is cannot be charged nor insurance companies do cover as per the last discussion but even doing this free of cost gives us an opportunity that we show us the patients that we care for them times like these we are not letting the health health while away we as a team are there to support them now and for the times to come because building confidence with our patients is very 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 important probably this is a time that we need to show them instead of running behind catching our surgical numbers we need to be genuinely care for our patients so engaging our patients in this times is very very important that we need to work together as a team in the second aspect of my presentation will be ensuring the perioperative safety especially when they are in the hospital so my next few slides will be on these four aspects of restarting bariatric surgeries preoperative evaluation ensuring surgical safety within the operation theater and post operative care i think restarting bariatric surgeries was my question i think the poll was divided 
there been a set of patients who a uh, set of audience who believe that we should start with the young or the other set who believe we should start with the comorbids but more importantly i think uh, the american college of surgeons and the other recommendations everybody had kind of clear in the sense that there should be a in reducing incidence for at least 14 days of covid in our community we cannot talk in the country aspect in our community and our hospital should not be a covid treating hospital so at this point decisions can be taken about restarting bariatric surgeries from the context of local setup it cannot be generalized we cannot talk from an india perspective we cannot start from the country's perspective for example in india there has been the curves has been completely different from different states even within my state my capital chennai has an increasing trend i live from a um, i am from a city where there is no covid cases for the last 15 to 20 days so this is a, uh, a point i can start bariatric cases but may not chennai so decision has to be make uh, taken upon local considerations and we need to have a look at the numbers and the incidents in our community and preoperative evaluation of course try to finish all preoperative screening pri pri primarily by a telemedicine even before they come to the hospital try to reduce the time that the patient can actually spend in the hospital and preferably it's better they can self isolate in their home for at least 2 weeks to reduce any possible kind of an exposure because although covid testings are reasonably reliable there is a high false negative rate especially if it is taken from the throat but still even from the nasopharynx there are 30% false negative rates so self isolation as much as possible is to be recommended with regard to the patient selection yes begin off uh, even during the lockdown urgent and the semi emergent condition cases have to be continued but with regard to the non elective work wherein we need to uh, pr prioritize ourselves or are actually triage but avoid complex revisional bariatric surgeries to begin with and let your high risk patients like an obstructive sleep apnea patient or a patient above 60 years of age or a patient with a history of venous thromboembolism to be avoided in the beginning because you need to understand what is really going because the world is still learning we will continue to learn new sops will emerge so let's not begin your first case with the highest risk case I think a structural approach on safely introducing bariatric surgery from the Aluminium group was published about a couple of days back. So here they felt if we can begin up, they they try to prioritize patients based on low risk to intermediate risk to a higher risk. It was felt that if we can do the low risk first, we will be able to understand the difficulties, the procedural issues, the hiccups that we might have. then move towards the intermediate risk and then move towards a higher risk so this will give us a time for a breathing space even if a mishap happens the mishap will be on the lower risk the chances of a morbidity or mortality is going to be much less than on a tier 3 group of course opinions are varied but this is a kind of an understanding but then you cannot be um, beating around the bush too long for the tier 1 because at the end of the day tier 2 on the tier 3 patients are those where obesity is a life saving condition where obesity is life threatening where doing a bariatric surgery is going to be life saving so these two are the subset of patient that we should be prioritizing however the tier 1 set of patients will help us understand the difficulties and the hiccup within the hospital environment so with regard to some surgical the similar kind of recommendation also we had given to our uh, from our obesity surgery society of india to start off with the easiest cases but then it try to move on let's say five to seven cases your easy cases then move on to your intermediate or higher risk cases so these are some important intraoperative points that could be considered especially during an operation try to enter the abdomen using muscle splitting trocars try not to do the open open method try to avoid leaks around the trocars or, or around the nethensins try to make the skin incision smaller than the, let's say a 4 mm kind of a, kind of a skin incision or have some kind of a sutures try to have one extra fine mom pore for the suction cannula to remove the aerosols try to have a careful and a swift introduction of staplers and suture materials to reduce the leaks always try to close the ports with the port in place or in a deflated abdomen and even in a robotic procedures try to have the robotic surgeon to wear a basic ppe and have an experienced person by the table who can handle the leakage and the smoke evacuation and these are some special post operative instructions which you could follow in your day to day practice especially with this covid environment around try to discharge the patients as early as possible and try to have make them stay somewhere very close by so that they have a ready access to the hospital especially in the initial days of course we have a general advice about leaks about fevers about pain but give them general covid protection advices and also signs suggestive of bariatric complications 
and COVID related complications and any respiratory symptoms in the post operative period should be treated urgently and should be considered a differential diagnosis and try to have an emergency 24 hour contact number and try and you as an operative surgeon try to be reachable to the patient even in your weekends because to avoid any kind of an administrative delay and eventually higher chance of morbidity and mortality and special advice on immuno, immune boosting diets like vitamin C, zinc rich foods can be stressed and try to con engage your patients continuously as they stressed upon in the earlier part of my presentation through Zoom or WhatsApp video interactions and try to encourage low impact home exercises, YouTube exercises, yoga, etc. can be suggested, especially predominant of the gymnasiums and the fitness centers are closed at these point of times. So coming to the conclusion of my talk, yes, the future is uncertain. Yes, we need to start living with COVID for some time. We're not sure until when. However, we need to move on and engaging our patients waiting for surgery and in the post-operative period, it is our responsibility, it's our duty. And we need to adopt newer technologies that are available, which may bridge the gap methodology, especially in engaging our patients and continuing our ongoing clinical care. Bariatric surgeries can be restarted when the situation is conducive as per the environment, your setting, your local setting, your hospital setting. And we need to keep changing our SOPs. We need to keep watching. We need to keep learning from each other. And adoption of standardized and safe SOPs is a must with a clear audit. Because many a times what we are doing, we need to audit ourselves, I would say, as in a weekly basis so that we could keep changing our SOPs because we are learning every day and let's continue to learn, let's continue to teach and let's all evolve together. And hopefully I believe we all can fight this pandemic and come out of this very soon. Wish you all a luck and uh, let's all stay safe and responsible. Hopefully a bariatric surgeries will emerge back to normalcy as soon as possible. Thank you all for your patient listening. Thank you Parveen for, for an excellent presentation. So I have a couple of questions for you and then um, maybe we'll have also uh, Ayub and uh, and uh, Miguel a comment. So the first question is, since most of this virtual care is not covered in India, how do you get the rest of the team engaged? I'm having difficulty engaging our dietitians, physicians, and surgeons, even though these are billable visits, although the billing is a little less than in person. So how do you get the rest of the team engaged uh, to help you in this process while this is not billable? Yes, yeah, so fin financially, it's quite difficult to motivate the team. However, interestingly, predominant of the centers in India, especially other than the bariatric surgeon, the other team members are paid on a monthly basis. So it is not that they would be paid more if they have more consultation or paid less if they have lesser, a lesser consultation. So this obviously, uh, what is it does not, uh, discourages them let's say for example i am not really paid for all this consultation for this time that i'm really spending so that aspect is taken care of already in predominant of the centers in the country including my center and the second aspect of it yes we need to keep our team motivated right from the beginning making them understand that they are as important as the bariatric surgeon in the team if they if each one each one member in the team believes that their role is important in optimizing or improving the patient care their role is as important as getting operative procedure done. The motivation is already there. So this as a the leader of the team, the bariatric surgeon, I think needs to get this motivation continuously on. I think more than the virtual meeting from the patients, we need to have a lot of virtual meetings within ourselves to just keep each or one of us motivated that we are there. Let's not lose the zeal. We need to continue the care because patients, we are responsible for our patients. If we can inject that culture, I think we can keep motivating our team and I'm lucky to have a good team of that sort. Sure, two questions. One from Yasser Al-Jabouri asking you why an extra five millimeter port? And I'm asking you also, do you test all patients for COVID PCR before elective bariatric surgery? Okay, so the extra port is uh, usually because many, many times there are multiple instruments that keep going in and out of the various ports. And usually on the regular fine ports that we have, when the harmonics and the other instruments go in, the gas really does not go. So what happens is if you have an additional port that is already available wherein you can have a smoke evacuation, it's fine. But then many a times you do not have the ports enough to have the smoke because especially when you're doing a three port or a four port technique, you do not have a port for the smoke evacuation. So you might have to use an extra port for the smoke to be evacuated because there has been this controversy that's going, the air, the peritoneal air might contain COVID 
although it has been a controversial area it be it, it actually began when the uh, Royal College of Surgeons have the paper that this peritoneal hair might have sure. COVID. It's still a controversial aspect, but until we have a concrete evidence, let's not just let the air out. Let's try to have a smoke evacuation kind of a system using that extra pore if you do not have one. You test for COVID before surgery. As a policy uh, in my uh, Coimbatore hospital, wherein uh, we are in the green zone, we are testing RT-PCR for all the patients. But in our Chennai center, where we are actually having, uh, where the cases incidence is very high, we are testing COVID for the patients and also for the attender uh, who would be staying with a patient. But as a recommendation from the Obesity Surgery Society of India, we have recommended that every patient who undergoes a bariatric surgery to undergo an RT-PCR mandatory. So Miguel, I have a, I have a question for you. you. You mentioned that Mexico is in the peak of the curve and we have now heard that Brazil and Latin America in general is now leading uh, as a continent or a country in number of deaths and 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 the COVID crisis. How how are you dealing with with the COVID patients? Are you testing all patients? And what are you doing in the office? Uh, like for instance, I'll give you a quick example. Um, last week we had a patient come to our office in preparation for a surgery, and when we tested them, they were COVID positive. They were asymptomatic. But because we, we have had masks in the office, the patient had a mask, there was no exposure. But had that patient went through surgery, he would have probably affected many people in the office and many people at the hospital. So how are you dealing with this in Mexico? Well, uh, first of all, I would say that it's very difficult to say Latin America is going away or Latin America is in that position. Because even in Mexico, we have areas where we are at the peak and we have areas where there are almost no patients with COVID infection. So in Mexico City, we have not started our bariatric practice. We are planning to start our bariatric uh, practice next month, and we are planning to test all the patients before going there. The hospital where I work, it's mandatory to test all patients who undergo elective surgery, both biochemically and also by a uh, uh, chest CT, uh, in order to make sure that they don't have the disease. But there are some uh, colleagues in the north part of Mexico that live in areas with almost no COVID infections that they have started the practice. And as far as I know, they are testing all the patients. They are doing remote uh, consultation before surgery. They are testing the patients while they get to the hospital. And uh, if the patient comes uh, positive, they will cancel the operation. We, we have not been do, using CAT scan. Can you tell me uh, or tell the group, how are you utilizing CT scan in the algorithm of testing? In the algorithm of testing patients for elective surgery, we are doing CAT scan as a routine. Now for patients, uh, for taking care of patients with COVID, if the patient is symptomatic, they get a CAT scan. If the patient is asymptomatic, Patients go home and unless become symptomatic, they don't get examination of the chest. Excellent. Uh, so, I, how how is the situation in in Saudi Arabia? And can you tell me in your offices, uh, is everyone wearing masks? Are you practicing uh, social distancing in the office? Have you had patients just like ours who are asymptomatic and tested positive in Saudi Arabia? Uh, no, in in terms of um, uh, exposure to patients who's infected and underwent bariatric surgery, no. In terms of patients who have uh, COVID in the hospital, yes, and they are admitted, and ICU also patient. Um, in terms of our practice currently, and also in Saudi Arabia, the ideal and the recommendation is to do uh, PCR testing for all patients undergoing elective surgery. However, unfortunately, when you look to the availability of the all tools, there are about seven centers that provide central labs that provide BCR. So some patients will wait for a while until they get their result. It's not easy, accessible for every patient. Some hospital, when they have the center in their hospital, easy to get the result quickly. There was also some uh, in the presentation about isolating the patient uh, for two weeks before after the test. I don't know if it will be practical, honestly, in our practice. You know our patients, how really eager they are, and even they are worried and they are really concerned about being in a room or in an area on their family for two weeks and then going for surgery by itself, it's a lot of stress. So I don't think that will be practical in our area. 
testing pre-op is yes. Doing mask for every ba for every single uh, uh, individual entering the medical center is mandatory. They will not be allowed to enter the center without a mask. And there will be visual screening on arrival. There will be a checklist on the fever, contact, and others. And also those who are coming and uh, uh, we confirm their appointment. The team who's confirming the appointment in the clinic are screening visually or verbally with the patients. They have they been in contact? Any one of the family has been infected with COVID uh, patient? Anyone has the symptoms? And if any of them have any positive results of these uh, screening questions, they will be asked to go to COVID de designated area for testing before coming to the center or coming to their appointment. There is no relative coming with them to their appointment. There is no kids below 15 coming to their appointment. And there is separation and isolation. So all, at least in every single waiting area, there is one and a half liter, a meter or so. And this is mandatory by OMOH. All these parameters are carried out in the context of COVID management in our, uh, let us say, preventive measure that we are doing. I think the most important concern in our mind is the testing. Do we need to do BCR for every patient? Based on the prevalence of the disease, disease, like if it's not that prevalent, should we do it or do it? The ideal, yes, we do it. Is it practical? Is it something we should do? Is it possible to do? And how long would it delay the patient arrival to their procedure? So, so thank you, Ayd. And I think uh, I want to maybe make a quick comment and then ask the entire group uh, about what they're doing. So we test everyone who was undergoing surgery 72 hours before and we ask them to quarantine at home once the test is negative. Um, and in addition, there is no visitation at the hospital. So you come alone uh, to get the surgery. So I wanna, I wanna hear quickly from Sonia, Betsy, we've already heard from uh, 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 Parveen and uh, Miguel and I. What do you guys do in Italy and in Baltimore? So we have the same procedure. We do uh, three days before surgery, nasopharyngeal swab, isolation, and um, prior and post-surgery. We are all wearing masks. Same procedures. Like you and is, there, is there a visitation allowed or a visitation not allowed? No, no, no visitors. No visitors in the whole hospital. Right. Uh, Betsy? Yep, exactly the same. And as far as the staff, um, we every single day have a check-in where we get our temperatures checked and ask if we have any symptoms related to COVID-19. And then we wear little stickers that say that we were screened. So exactly the same as what you're doing as well. Right, right. And and, and the reason I ask is, is because I, I would be very hesitant to have anyone start bariatric surgery where there is COVID in the community and not test patients because we know that obesity is a risk factor. And CDC has put patients with BMI over 40 as a high risk group equal to renal disease, liver disease, lung disease, age over 65. So the last thing we need is to have a stigma that associates bariatric surgery with COVID complications and or deaths. And it, it has been reported in the annals uh, about some cases that happened in in Italy, so so uh, uh, thank you, thank you all for for for, for your comments. Uh, and let's move to the last presentation by uh, uh, Sonia. But before we start, we'll have uh, the last poll. Um, um, so the last poll is: Which of the following is not an urgent bariatric procedure and should therefore not be performed during the COVID-19 pandemic? A slippage of a gastric band, internal hernia, uh, perforation of a one anastomosis gastric bypass intragastric balloon removal, trocarcite hernia. And maybe while we're waiting, I'll have Miguel and I weigh in on a question from Dr. Mahindra Loda from, uh, I'm not sure where, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, it's not mentioned here. Can we wait for bariatric surgery restart until the pandemic is completely over? Is this realistic to just wait? Well, if I had to answer, I would say no, because this may last for several months. But I think that once the pandemic is under control, we can safely start bariatric surgery. Otherwise, many patients are going to suffer for the waiting time. Thank you, uh, uh, Miguel, for a quick answer to the point. Ayat? 
for me, I think we, we should not wait, and I don't think it's uh, acceptable to wait, considering unless the disease is prevalent severely as in some areas, but in general, if it is not what we have in Saudi Arabia or other area around us, I don't think it's fair to wait. And 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 I would I would agree as well. If there's one comment I I I would make, if you if you allow me, is uh, truly if you bring patients to the office, you need to check their temperature. Uh, everybody needs to be wearing a mask. And when someone shows up, when they're not wearing a mask, the staff have to also have goggles on or face protection because your conjunctiva is a source of infection as well. And then. Uh, there have to be social distancing if you have COVID cases in the community to protect the staff in the office. And if that patient is going to have surgery to protect the patient and everybody at the hospital, they need to be to be tested at least three days before surgery. So, Manuela, can you uh, show us the poll results, please? Thank you. So, uh, intragastric balloon removal. Um, uh, uh, most people considered uh, uh, not to be performed. Uh, followed by trocarcite hernia after sleeve, followed by slippage of a gastric band, followed by internal hernia, the gastric bypass. Uh, the results is a surprise to me. And uh, Manuela, can you take the poll down? Uh, so next I will have uh, uh, Sonia, um, and uh, I'm gonna take one last attempt at your last name, uh, Chiapetta. Chiapetta. Right. <laughs> okay, Chiapetta, okay. So Sonia is gonna uh, uh, give us the, the last presentation. So Sonia, please. Uh, um, go ahead. Good afternoon from Italy to all of you. Thank you, Manuela. Thank you to the IFSO community for organization. And it's my pleasure to talk about the patient experience during COVID-19 and the role of Facebook, Instagram, and FaceTime during this pandemic. This was the poll. You know, Italy was the first European country affected by COVID and um, national lockdown was instituted on 9 of March. And at the beginning, there was a great confusion um, how to go on. Yeah, we had, um, we, I've stopped surgery, bariatric surgery immediately, but um, we had to see um, what are surgeries who have to be which have to be performed and we had in these last two months urgent bariatric surgeries obviously we had uh, marginal ulcer uh, perforation i had a lot of slippage um because this is an old hospital where gastric bands um, bands were positioned in the past i had internal hernias i had imagination and um, the most important thing at the beginning was to, to find a way how to go on. And a big question at the end of March was um, how to proceed with our intragastric balloons because uh, we are a center of excellence. Um, we, are positioning, uh, we are positioning about six balloons a month and um, we had six patients at the end of March in which um, the balloon had to be removed and um, also approval was coming and we didn't know how long this pandemic could last. So um, we had a multidisciplinary discussion and at the end we decided to protect ourselves with full PPEs and um, to perform intragastric balloon removal because we didn't know how long the pandemic proceed. And I have to say in south of Italy, we had never the numbers that we had in the north of Italy. Um, we were fortunate that the um, national lockdown um, protected in the end south of Italy and we never had so many cases. So um, our hospital was quite protected um, we had obviously um, cases in the emergency area. We had um, to perform surgery, general surgery in patients with um, COVID-19. But um, the numbers, we had about maybe 50, 60 patients with COVID-19. So um, we performed intergastic balloon removal um, 12 patients, March, 
April and also May now we, we removed in six patients and we did not have any, had any problem. So this for us was important. Um, what is uh, urgent, but what is semi-urgent? Um, should we perform um, these procedures? And obviously the last question was um, elective biotic surgery. Obviously we stopped but this means that we had to stop first interviews because our patients um, weren't seen. We had to stop follow up, and um, yeah, COVID uh, uh, didn't allow us to do anything anymore. And um, I asked myself, which function as a bariatric surgeon, surgeon without a knife during this global pandemic? Um, you know, when we can operate only um, urgent cases, um, we have less, uh, we have much more time. And um, at the beginning, I analyzed our old data from, from Germany, um, from the clinic of Rudolf Weiner, and analyzed um, the patients um, which uh, underwent elective biotic surgery and um, who underwent um, measurement of interleukin-6 because here in Italy, um, in Naples, we had uh, an important discussion um, of the tuzilizumab, an anti-interleukin-6 um, receptor, um, which uh, had good outcomes in COVID patients. So I analyzed um, our patients and found that um, the mean um, interleukin-6 was uh, higher in patients with obesity. And that means we now know it, but it, in the beginning, uh, we had no um, signs. We now know that patients with obesity are at higher risk due to the chronic inflammation due to obesity and um, I ask myself how can I spread information, um, how I can keep communication with my patients. Um, I have this uh, biotic surgery unit here. I'm on my own. I perform about 200 surgeries a year. I'm here from March uh, 2019 so it's one year and um, I still have under control my patients. Uh, with Rudolf Weiner, we have performed more than 1,000 surgeries a year, so it was not possible um, to follow up the patients. But here with now uh, 250 patients, I can control them. So I ask myself, how can I go on? And um, at the end, um, Betsy has a great, um, yeah, great uh, work done. Uh, you have a really, uh, you have a business, yeah, I think with this. But uh, at the end, I was a surgeon here in Naples and didn't know um, how to have the contact with my patients. So I started to, to use Facebook and Instagram um, to give information to the patients, um, to the, let them know that they can contact us if they have have problems. I have to say in Italy, quite every patient has my private phone number, so um, they call me also <laughs> at the night. But um, with Facebook, you, you, you can give much more information. So we have a, a home pay, uh, site um, from the hospital. I have my private site and also um, my nutritionist and my psychologist have uh, done the same thing. The nutritionist um, gave uh, recommendations uh, with Facebook. Um, the psychologist did virtual visits with uh, Skype, FaceTime. And um, with the Italian Facebook group, we did webinars and um, there are a lot of uh, patients who, who attended the last webinar we did, uh, I did with a colleague from Rome, a psych, um, psychologist, we had more than 1,800 attendees. So um, in this moment where the patient uh, were at home, it was the only way to communicate and the whole 
I think the whole patience uh, stayed uh, with Facebook and Instagram the whole day. And um, I had much more time, no congresses, uh, no uh, OR. So um, I started also an Instagram account. And um, yeah, it was a great experience because um, the patient want to be now on my account um, showing the, um, the pictures prior to surgery and post-surgery. So they sent me quite every day, five patients sent me photos. Um, I have lost 20 kilograms. Now I have lost 25 kilograms and I lost 30 kilograms. And um, they get motivated with this. And this is, I think, really, really important. Um, the motivation of the patient, um, yeah, the, the, the connection, um with the patient i always say to my patients you have to find someone who follows you it can be me as a surgeon it can be the nutritionist the psychologist but you have to have someone um and uh, they love it yeah they love it to show um how uh, their progresses are and um i find it a great way um to stay in touch with them and uh, there are also uh, other, obviously, um, colleagues who do this, Eduardo Greco, Fiana Bashke, Andre Sarmiento. Um, they posted uh, during this COVID time, um, yeah, some, some um, messages how to, to stay healthy, um, not to be afraid, um, how to protect yourself. And um, I think um, in these days, uh, in bariatric surgery, um, FaceTime, Instagram are really important um, tools to, to motivate patients, uh, also to engage patients. And at the end, it's a little bit like plastic surgery um, because our patients, it is a disease. We treat the disease, but um, at the end, they, they want they want to to be thinner and um it's important to show their results so we we started by surgery on uh, 7th of may so three weeks ago i started i've performed 12 cases now um full ppe smoke filtration how we did, uh, said before nasopharyngeal swaps prior to surgery in all patients three days before no visitors, and uh, my internal protocol was to start with um, the low-risk patients. Um, in this moment, our hospital is COVID-free. I think one important thing um, to say is before, and this we did, before um, you restart surgery, in our case, bariatric surgery, the whole hospital has to um, undergo uh, test, PCR testing, because um, at the end, I think in the north of Italy, um, discussing with colleagues from Milan, um, there was, they understimulated the situation and nobody wore masks. And at the beginning, um, the risk wasn't seen. And um, a lot of healthcare providers had uh, asymptomatic COVID-19 and spread it in the hospital at the end. So the hospitals were full of, of uh, the virus. And so we did really a testing of the whole of the whole hospital and before restarting elective surgery. And until now, fortunately, um, we did not have any case of positive patients. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Kepet, very much for staying on time and for the excellent presentation. So I have uh, um, uh, a question, which is, uh, you know, starting these Facebook and Instagram groups is great. And I've, I've, I've come convinced they're excellent, but I've had major difficulty with our hospital, which is a large healthcare system, adopting the idea of uh, starting a Facebook or an Instagram or a Twitter uh, feed for our program, because we are in the Department of Surgery and no other uh, section is asking for, for this. So that's the first question. And then once we started, it's a labor intensive 
uh, problem. So maybe if I can have you and Betsy comment on how do you convince uh, the administration to start it? And then how do you keep this labor intensive uh, work going? Uh, uh, so we'll have you, Sonia, start first and then have Betsy chime in. This is a really important question because um, I have to say I started on my own because um, I wanted to have uh, the connection to the patients and um, the two months of quarantine I had the time I was here in hospital but I has had much less to do um, so I started obviously now restarting normal <laughs> surgical work um, it's hard to answer, but I have just talked to the administration and um, we have one secretary um, who can who can start to do the work right now because I cannot uh, manage it anymore. It's too much now. Um, I think you can convince um, the, the, the administration to have one secretary to 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 manage it. Betsy? Sure. So I also started it on my own. That was the single best thing I've done in my career. I started it in 2013. I have a secret online support group through Facebook for my patients where they can interact, they can engage together, they can share their struggles, their successes. All the content is driven by them. I set out the parameters, the disclaimers, the rules, but ultimately the patients are the ones who um, I, I let you know share it. I don't I don't approve their post beforehand. If they are bullying somebody else or they're writing something inappropriate, I'll delete it. But I don't really spend too much time with it. As far as the administration goes, I keep it completely separate from that. It just happens to be 8,000 of my own patients, but it's just the way that where they um, congregate. And I. I'm from the camp of, you know, beg for um, forgiveness later. Like I don't ask for permission to do it because it's something that I know I'm the subject matter expert. It needs to be done. And I'm not going to let some bureaucratic, you know, nonsense get in the way of that. And, and being an employee, that does not cause a problem. I mean, it does sometimes, um, but it's the risk I'm going to need to take because now, I mean, at first it was like, wait, what, what are you doing? What is she, we know when it started to catch fire, but again, it's, um, I believe um, in the patient experience and I believe in what I'm doing. And sometimes you have to have those tough conversations to explain yourself and what the patients want, but um, I'm willing to do it. I'm willing to do it. I think, Abdurrahman, if you allow me just to, in our area, at least, I think there are two parts. One is the private and one is the government and uh, Ministry of Health and others. And you know, if it is paid by the government, there will be no much of enthusiasm to try to establish the platform and do things like that because they will leave it through the usual routine. But in the private sectors, which represent maybe 80% of bariatric practice in our area, I think it should be uh, built through the uh, hospital administration with the support of the physician and other expert matters in the, in the field. There should be a platform that people will engage in it, book their appointment virtually, uh, organize virtually. There is some communication through the coordinator with them virtually, and then their appointment finally with the physician and so on and so forth with the payment. Unless that's integrated, it will be still individual and uh, matters and uh, personal work that will never be in a long-term uh, uh, manner. So I think if we are going to establish this, it has to be in a very structured manner through the hospital or the center or whatever practice and through some sort of platform that's already there with clear integrations, clear instruction for the patient how to get in and also for the expert and the, and the physician and the healthcare providers, how to get in. Um, thank you, Ayat. There's uh, comments and questions from the participants that I would like to address. One, there's a comment from Abdurrahman al Sayyid from Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. He's saying that they've had a good experience with virtual clinics in Saudi Arabia, that patients are motivated, so that's, that's great to hear. There's a comment from Dr. Nuguera um, uh to Betsy. Do you recommend new tri health after the group consultation? And I would like Betsy, in full disclosure, to tell us who owns uh, new tri health. Yes, I own new tri health. I am in full disclosure of that. Um, my partner Gus and myself, we created it, and 
Um, we run it and we believe in it. So yes, I do recommend New Try Health um, to be started after their initial consult and it takes 12 weeks but you can change the time and so new tri health is done for three months um usually is what we um default it to and then ultimately the patient is adequately prepared they've done all those 25 different topics i showed you and then they come in for their final appointment which is when we schedule the surgery get the consents explain where to be what time to be there and um, do all that stuff so that is what we do so you know some of those questions earlier regarding your diet dietitian and the resources and getting everybody on board, well, my team is incredibly lean. We do 1,300 surgeries, we see over 2,000 new patients a year, and we have 12 supporting staff, and a part-time dietitian is only one of them. So we don't have this army of nurse navigators and all these specialists and dietitians and exercise physiologists. We, we just standardize that, we make it out there, and so patients all do the same experience, and then we can utilize our resources for things like the virtual support groups and the cooking classes and all those cool little things. Our team has more time to take care of those special details when you automate and make the, the majority of the other preparation standardized and, and convenient. So we're, we're coming at the tail end of, of our webinar, and I don't want to forget to thank Johnson & Johnson for their uh, support of our webinar uh, today. There's one question I want to ask Parveen. Um, uh, IFSO has come up with a uh, position statement from the endoscopy task force led by Braham Budaya about the restarting endoscopy and also Aydal Tahtani. So maybe I want to get your opinion and I it says that you should not restart endoscopy before bad surgery for eight weeks before. Yeah, wait for eight weeks. But it doesn't say eight weeks from what? From the peak, from the end, from the start. So our group have found it very difficult um, to to do that. And we've we've decided to test everyone uh, use full, full uh, protection and then re just restart uh, endoscopy. So can you can you comment and then I'll have Ayat comment as well. Okay. Um, so as as you clearly put it, eight weeks is really not clear. But I think uh, we see still nobody certain on how things are going and how things are expected to go. And even in let's say even in eight weeks of not having a case itself, is it a good thing? No, we do not know. Because as you know, the numbers now are predominantly asymptomatic. So even not having numbers is not a really good thing. So until I think I think uh, time to move on with our elective work, with endoscopic work, we, we can restart considering there is a tapering trend. I mean, it shouldn't be increasing rapidly. That is, it is there, it is all there in the community and is there in the hospital. But if there is a decreasing trend, maybe that eight weeks can be looked at as a decreasing trend, and your hospital is not really tre treating COVID positive patients in a big way, I think we can restart endoscopic work is what I personally believe. But then, until then, COVID is probably outside the community. Regular testing should be contemplated, considering the testing is freely available around the world at this point of time. I, for, for me, Abdurrahman, I, we uh, mm -hmm. recommend starting and definitely with the same protocol, um, definite uh, screening first and then applying very strict protocol, especially in gastrointestinal because of the high exposure to the patient and, uh, and the GI tract. So very good strict protocol for the healthcare providers in addition to the screening and we started, there should be no problem. So there's a comment, thank you, Ayad. There's a comment from uh, Adrian Brown. Uh, it is important to know that, uh, at, that at present, there's no evidence that any diet can be used to improve or boost immune function or prevent infection, example, increasing vitamin C. Nutrients can help with normal functioning of the immune system. So instead, it is key to maintain a balanced diet to support the normal immune system. I agree. So I want to uh, like end our presentation with a, a, an important question. Sonia uh, Chiapetta showed us today that they had to divide their surgeries into uh, three different buckets. Everybody agreed that patient needs to get testing before uh, a surgery. Everybody agreed that in the office, you need to use virtual as much as you can, but in the in-person, patients need to wear masks, your staff have to wear masks, and you test people 72 hours before. But we have not agreed on what is the definition of these three buckets in places where COVID is gonna have a surge. I'll tell you what we've done, and I would like to hear from the group. So our um, department asked us to identify urgent cases that have to be done within days, 
um, essential cases that has to be done within two months and non-essential elective patients that have to be done more than two months. And I could not find bariatric surgery to fit except in the essential, non-essential elective with the exception of the emergencies that Sonia has presented. I wanna hear everybody's opinion. So bariatric surgery, despite it being important, despite treating an important disease, you'll have to fall in the wording of non-essential elective surgery that has that can wait for two months. I want to hear what everybody's opinion is and how you've had this divided in your place. Let's start with Miguel, and then we'll move to Ayal, then we'll hear Parveen, and then finally Sonia. And if Betsy's still around, I know she had patients that she had to go see, we'll also hear her opinion. So Miguel. Yeah, we have a similar definition that you have. The patients who need prompt surgical treatment, either because they uh, are diseased and they were controlled and now they are getting out of control, we will prioritize those patients. But for the rest of the patients, we will call them non-essential. And if they can wait for a month or two, we think that's safer for them to wait. I, I will say two things. One, I think we are beyond that stage because now we are going down in the curve in almost every country, almost. So we are beyond that uh, defini uh, de de dividing the patients like emergency and others. However, we have used it in our area, emergency, semi-elective, where it's one day to 30 days, and after 30 days, the elective. Nowadays, we start all elective surgery. Uh, it's also through the Ministry of Health uh, regulations. So we are back to normal in terms of number of cases. However, the number of cases are decreased, the schedule, the number of cases in the clinic are decreased, and that's the control that we are doing at the moment. So the reason I, I think this is important is uh, WHO yesterday said that there is a very like, high likelihood of having not a second wave, but a no, second wave in the same wave in many countries if they reintroduce and reopen quickly. So we as bariatric surgeons need to not only know this for the fact, but even if you're on the downslope, there is a chance. So we are prepared even in Charlotte that there might be a second peak where we have to stop surgeries again. So uh, absolutely. Uh, absolutely, I agree with you, Abdurrahman. Especially nowadays, we open everywhere and all the commercial started and everything. So there is a risk, definitely. And I don't know if that risk come back, if it comes back to a huge load in the healthcare system, then I I'm sure we'll go back to square one in terms of uh, having this uh, like emergency or essential and essential. Uh, Parveen? Yeah, I think with uh, the WHO, a lot of the predictions going wrong. So I think we need not be really to be bothered about that. I think what is basically responsible is we need to take the responsibility for our patients. I think even if there isn't no cases, we should be careful. And even if there are many cases, we should be extremely careful. We should not be like, okay, let's start, because this saying of let's start uh, learning to live with Corona is now becoming very, very popular. But I think that shouldn't be the so with in a, in, a, in a hospital setting. I think we need to, yes, prioritize patients who need emergency care. I think the American College of Surgeons gave this classification in the in in March, just to do the emergency care and the semi-emergent to wait for some time and then the elective. But I think predominant of the countries have now moved towards, we have started to devise protocols, SOPs. We now have RT-PCR testings available. I think we can gradually move forward in elective. Of course, all the emergencies and the semi-emergencies need to be handled. But I think with elective work, we need to be very careful in picking our patients, probably not a very high risk because they would be the most there's no positivity. There's no positivity. So I think in that sense we can definitely move on, but with extra caution. Thank you, Parveen. Sonia. So I think um, the time tells us what to do. At the beginning, um, we had to perform only uh, urgent surgery. Now we are living with COVID and we are doing testing, uh, protection uh, of patients, uh, healthcare providers. So in my opinion, elective surgery has to go on because obesity is a chronic disease. Um, it is not plastic surgery. Um, we have to go on because if not, our patients get higher weight, they get more ill, 
and um, they ha have a higher uh, morbidity mortality risk. And in this time, I think, and I use it a lot because I have uh, studied uh, it a lot, I have worked with Arya Sharma, um, I think the Edmonton Obesity Staging uh, System is really important um, to see patients with Edmonton score zero and one, maybe they can wait if you have a long waiting list and so on. And a patients who have an Edmonton score two, that means diabetes, hypertension, um, sleep apnea and so on, um, they have to undergo surgery because if you wait too long, they get Edmonton three, three or four in the worst case, and then you have a higher mortality. So I think, um, now how the pandemic is proceeding, um, our elective surgeries have to go on, but we now have to look on what, where to give the priority. Sure. So just uh, to conclude, uh, I, I would like to address the rest of the questions that are there. So I, I will ask each one of you the question I want a short answer. So first, Miguel Ahmed Bashir, the chairman of our communication committee, thank you, Ahmed, for tuning in, is asking, what do you do with patients who still have a huge stigma and wish to hide the fact that they're having bariatric surgery during the pandemic, how do you support them within a busy practice? So Miguel, short answer. Well, I mean, I think you need to give the best support that you can. And if the patient is still in control, uh, you can wait a little bit. If the patient gets out of control, you will have to take care of the patient first. Great, uh, thank you for, uh, for the quick answer. Uh, Sonia, uh, the question was for Betsy and you. Uh, what, from Dr. Eli Baruki or Eli Baruki, I'm not sure if it's a physician. What do you do if the patient doesn't have the platform for virtual visits? These are the patients um, who need uh, a phone call. Um, everybody has a phone, and um, then with phone call you can you can proceed. Sure. Next question for Ayub. Uh, uh, do you do general anesthesia for all EGDs from Khaled Hamdan from the UAE? Ayad, uh, you're muted. We do, uh, no, we don't do general anesthesia. We do uh, uh, sedations, uh, but full precautions in terms of the mask and, and the face and uh, uh, all the type of precautions, but not general anesthesia. Uh, the next question from Firas Fayad. Did anyone experience a COVID positive patient uh, during the pandemic? Anyone? Patient who's having surgery, asymptomatic, became positive before or after? We had one patient before. Anybody? I, had did not, I did not have myself, but we have in our community people who develop COVID after surgery. Sure. Yes, sir, Jiburi has a very general question we will not be able to address today. What is the economic state during COVID? I, I suspect it's not good. And for the sake of time, I think we're not going to be able to answer that question. There's a comment from German Nifuri, excellent presentations. I agree. Uh, they were excellent. Abdurrahman Asaya from Riyadh said he's connected with Betsy Dovak and learned a lot from her. So uh, uh, thank you, Abdurrahman, for your comment. And finally, Enrique Leon said, congratulations, interesting topics and well covered. Uh, and I agree. Again, I want to thank um, J&J for the support, Manuela for the excellent organization. Our excellent speakers, Betsy Dovek, Parveen Raj, and Sonia Kiapeta, and our excellent discussants, Miguel Herrera and Aydal Kahtani. Thank you all for, for tuning in. Any departing comments from anyone? No. no stay safe. Thank you so much. Stay safe. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.